Oh, 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 oh. Oh, baseball. As one American writer has said, baseball is a country all to itself. Come on, Al, let's go. A country where there is little distance between the players and the fans. And a country that still gives you three chances to succeed. Do any other countries still do that? If this baseball country has a beginning, it's in the small American heartland towns like Sleepy Eye, Hanska, Stillwater, Springfield, New Ulm, and Stark. Stark, Minnesota, not even a town, just two country roads intersecting in the middle of a soybean field. In the right field, number 36, Dwayne Helga. The second baseman, wearing number 39, Burge Helga. The center fielder, number 30, Dave Helga. Playing first base, number 37, Vic Helga. Helgats. They're all Helgats. At one time, we had 13 Helgats. Then we went to the state tournament for, well, I think, eight years. We went three years hand running. It was all Helgut. And when they called that out over the mic, well, everybody says, what is Helgut? How are you going to tell the name? Well, but it's a Helgut, it's a Helgut, it's a Helgut. Well, but they all have a different name, though. One is a Vic, one is a Birch, one is a Kurt, and this way. Yeah, that's, we had nine Helgut's. We had 13 Helgut's one time on the club. The interior intensity of baseball lovers is unmatched in any other sport. Writer Philip Roth called baseball the literature of his boyhood. He said it made him understand what patriotism was about at its best. One writer says that baseball makes you understand what patriotism is all about at its best. Oh. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't even... Really wouldn't really know how to answer that one, really. I, I wouldn't know. How, how should you answer that one? How would you answer that one? Part of the answer may lie in what writer Roger Angel says about baseball passion, a curious thing to the naked eye. On the surface, he admits baseball lovers may look a bit foolish in their enthusiasm over the flight of a ball. But the point, he says, is that they care deeply, a capacity that has almost gone out of our lives. Somebody said that if you want to understand America, you have to understand baseball. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, that's what they claim. If you, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that a boy, that a boy, here we go. Perhaps we've come to a time, says Angel, when it no longer matters so much what the caring is about. How frail or foolish is the object of that concern, as long as the feeling itself can be saved. Is it true that at one time you really wanted to play in the major leagues? Doesn't everybody? I still identify with players. You know, here I am at 42 thinking, God, if I could have been a major league baseball player, what a wonderful thing. Is that odd? Do you think that's eccentric? No, I, th I think that's the normal state of being. I, I'm sure there's lots of other people who do that. Don't you? Here we have the makings of an old-fashioned melodrama because baseball, for its truest fans, is an old-fashioned love. 
complete with all the sincere and simple melodramatic essentials, like One more kiss, The Hero, which in this case is the outdoor baseball park, where the city boys can become farmers once again. The Villain, the Dome Stadium, a modern facility which locks out the sky. The Object of Desire, the game of Major League Baseball, once known as America's chief national pastime. And of course, The Lover. Dave Yunowski, a bookstore owner in St. Paul, Minnesota, and an example of what happens when a man remains faithful to his first love from boyhood to eternity. Oh, dear, and of course, the vehicle. For in America, there can be no love story without a vehicle. I think that in the late 40s when I was a kid that baseball was so much a part of, of everyone's consciousness that when you were a boy, that's what you did. You went to baseball, you played baseball, you read baseball, your heroes were the, were the baseball players. There wasn't anything else. Campanella leading off for Brooklyn in the last half of the fourth. Clouts a homer into the left field seat in second in as many days. It, it's almost like a negative rite of passage when you realize that you're too old and your your chance of making it is never going to happen, you know, that you'll never be a major leaguer. But, you know, when I was a kid, I think that most boys thought that that's what they wanted to do, was grow up and be a major league baseball player, that that was the best thing in the world that you could ever do. Why? Tough question. I think that those were the the heroes that that we could best identify with, that best represented what an American man was supposed to be. One more kiss, dear. One more song. For anyone considering serious baseball love, this is the standard to be met. For such is the price of romance. Is Dave Yunowski, the 42-year-old owner of Hungry Mind Bookstore in St. Paul, Minnesota, is a serious baseball lover. His first memory was Babe Ruth's death in 1948. His first task every morning in baseball season is to check the sports page box scores. Every Sunday, for 30 years, he's played softball with his friends and two sons. And every year, he pursues the perfect outdoor game in brave pilgrimages to other baseball towns, sometimes in foreign countries. It's also Canadian. I don't know if that's going to make any difference. Out. Not there. They, they don't talk in French or anything. And in his bookstore, he gives baseball the same stage as philosophy or literature, quoting Hegel or Kafka, as well as he does Casey Stengel, or his favorite baseball manager of all time, Earl Weaver of the Baltimore Orioles. My favorite Weaver is he goes out to argue with the ump, and he gets real close to him, and then he can't get close enough, so he turns his head around, and he gets his head in there, I've seen that. For our love is such pain. People came from Eastern Europe, from mostly from cities, and they came here and lived in cities. But you know, somewhere there's the yearning for the 
the green grass and the trees and the farm, and that's it's part of everybody's uh, American shtick or whatever. I hate the dome. I hate going to the dome to watch baseball. It's just not baseball sitting inside. There's no, it doesn't smell right, it doesn't feel right. Yeah, can't, <laughs> it's disgusting. It destroys a lot of the, the actual play of the game. The play of the game is different in the dome. The ball bounces differently, the ball flies differently. The geometric position of the fielders in relation to the bases and all that changes because of how fast the ball bounces off the infield. Games are decided by bounces as if they were bouncing off of silly putty or, or rubber or whatever. There are things that are out of the control of the baseball players that happen because of the nature of the, of the artificial surface. And it takes the game away from the players. You know, there, there are too many extra factors deciding the game other than the skill of the players. The other thing is that the emotional climate in there is totally different. It's like sitting in a theater. People don't scream and holler unless they put the little applause sign on the, on the TV screen in there. There's no spontaneous excitement. People don't take their shirts off like you're supposed to at the ball game. You know? <laughs> Chicago, Yankee Stadium, Cleveland, uh, Forbes Field. I have a piece of Forbes Field in my my underwear drawer. At all. <laughs> Your underwear. Yeah. I keep all my valuables. Yeah. I have a seat marker from the Yankee Stadium before they tore it down. They called him Killer. This, of course, for his awesome and terrorizing effect on American League pitchers. His name is Harmon Killebro. I was born and raised in a little town in Idaho called Payette, and when I was eight years old, my father gave me uh, my first baseball glove. I'll never forget that. Uh, we used to play a lot of ball out in the front yard. My mother would say, yeah, you're, you're tearing up the grass and digging holes in the front yard. And my father would say, we're not raising grass here, we're raising boys. <laughs> or turf in, at Toronto? Turf. They do have turf. 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 Wait a minute. Turf. Let's take a vote on it here.
For the passionate fan, the game of baseball is a thing of bittersweet desire. Because like love, it must never be compromised, yet often is. These people don't know baseball in this town. We need. They don't know the, the inside stuff. They boo because they don't call a balk when there's no balk on that play, you know. So baseball's new in Canada. They also got a terrible field. You know, you can look at baseball as a mirror of the culture. Uh, you know, what we have now is uh, all of the ballparks look the same. All of the players tend to play the same. They use the same style. The coaching has taught them to be more regular. The uh, individuality of style in baseball is going out the window. You know, and that's certainly true in our culture. We've become a people who are acted upon rather than acting. We don't know how to cheer. We don't know how to play ball unless someone organizes us and directs us and teaches us. People don't learn on their own. People don't believe that they can affect their own destiny anymore. They're, they're missing out on the American dream. You know, Philip Roth called his baseball novel the great American novel. There's nobody to write that anymore, I don't think. For our love is such pain. The year 1983 brought a dramatic baseball coincidence to Baltimore, Maryland. The kind of coincidence hardcore baseball lovers truly relish, and one which until now has never been publicly disclosed. The story took place here in Memorial Stadium, home of the Baltimore Orioles. In the previous year, the Orioles had come within one cliffhanging game of making their division. The loss was sad but majestic. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, an equally majestic battle was being waged between this man, a relentlessly rebellious poet and writer, Andre Codrescu from Romania, and his adversary, hey, hey, Mama, said the, way you move, gonna make you sweat, gonna the U.S. Make Justice you Department's move. Immigration and Naturalization Bureau. But in 1983, something significant happened, and success came to both parties. The result was true baseball romance. This superb example of um, Nixon-Mitchell architecture behind me is where I struggled to get my citizenship for 10 years. It was an epic struggle, and I could never figure out why they were investigating me. I'm not a terribly dangerous. I didn't think I'd done anything horrendous, and there they were relentlessly investigating me. So one the time I had a weird flash that maybe they were investigating me because I didn't understand baseball. And so, um, one time, we, I came to the game, and I came all by myself, and all of a sudden it clicked, and I understood the game. Sure enough, the next day I got a letter, and uh, they said, okay, you can be a citizen now. That year, Andre Kodrescu got his citizenship, and the Baltimore Orioles won the pennant and the World Series. Perhaps you have to be a bit of a mystic to appreciate the coincidence, but it did leave the Orioles with an extraordinary fan. And where did it leave immigration? Hey, hey, mama said the way you move gonna make you sweat, gonna make you groove. There are guys with funny accents all over the field now. Dennis Martinez is from Nicaragua. I mean, any day now you'll have some great Romanian baseball player, who knows? I think uh, people who emigrate here take a liking to baseball. It's curious that here are people from all, from such different places, of such different cultures, and they find a common passion in this game that's uniquely American, while at the same time probably not understanding much else of America. Baseball becomes a great landmark in their belonging and their, in their becoming to belong. There's a feeling I get when I look to the west. 
For emigres and exiles, it's a long road from the grim face of immigration to the rock and roll of American culture. But for generations along this route, one grand and common concern has been the game of baseball. Not for nothing, then, does it impress Andre Kodrescu with a sense of what's possible in America in contrast to Europe. Europe is crowded. Eastern Europe is very crowded. And uh, that sense of the crowded is in the soccer game. There is nothing more terrifying than, than walking the wrong way up a narrow Eastern European provincial town street as the post-soccer crowd is coming toward you after the home team lost. In Romania, too, there is this distinction always was between the guys with glasses and the guys with muscles. So uh, there's nothing even, even worse is to be, to, to, to be this guy with glasses, Jewish intellectual, walking up the street in your lycée uniform, which is also another form of elitism, uh, as the crowd is, is coming toward you. I mean, the history of all kinds of persecution seems to bear down on you at that moment, and it's a, it's a real horror. So uh, I've had a horror of crowds because of it. For um, I think baseball cured me of it. I came here and I sit down, sit in the stadium, and there's guys with glasses, and there's Jews, and there's uh, women in shorts, and people knit, and they eat hot dogs. And it is truly popular in a, in a sense that I didn't, didn't know could, could be. You know, I mean, there are moments when the passion of the crowd congeals and everybody starts screaming at the same time, and there is, a, there is great tension. And at that time, I still feel that old terror, and I think, thank God they are calling for the ball, not for the blood of Jews. There is room, there is room in baseball. And the kind of timelessness happens there, which has something of the vastness of space in, in this country. The only times when, uh, when the crowd comes together, it's at moments just before the pitch and the great uh, time, the quality of time changes and you can feel the great tension in the, in, in the crowd. And it's almost a mystical moment. Everything is in suspension, then anything might happen. As the poet says, anything is possible at the moment of the pitch. Fair play is possible. Intelligent passion is possible. A culture is possible when people care deeply about a thing of elegance which amuses yet mystifies at the same time. Such a thing is baseball, bringing the warmth of romance to the vastness of the American landscape. strike away. Sandy into his windup. Here's the pitch. Swung out and missed a perfect game. Campanella leading off for Brooklyn in the last half of the fourth. Clouts a homer into the left field seat. His second in as many days. Out at first. Here's the pitch to Willie. Swung on, hit deep to left. That one is way back, way back. Way back, tell it goodbye, number 600 for Willie Mays, and the bye-bye baby Bonanza. And the Giants come to home plate to greet him, number 600 for Mays. He hit it over the 370-foot mark. A standing ovation here in San Diego for Willie. Standing up to have a good look at what may be the last play of the 1942 World Series. The pitch is swung on to ground ball, hits down towards second, Brown's up with it, throws to hop, and the World Series is over. Boys with Bats was a production of KTCA Channel 2.